My First Job by a Mad Painter, a.k.a. T.R. Becker. Chapter 1, How It All Began. I'm not sure if what I'm about to tell you, you will believe, but I no longer care what others think of me. I am no longer a young man, nearing the end of my life, and I feel that this needs to be known. I've spent most of my life as a security guard at a warehouse on the outer edges of a small town in the middle of a national park. I'm not going to tell you exactly where. The town people don't need the publicity. Many who are my friends still today. I never went to college and barely made it out of high school. So I don't have much of a choice when it came to finding a good paying job in the small town I grew up in. One of my high school friends, Mitch, was working the graveyard shift as a security guard at a local junkyard. There's not much going on in the small town late at night, and I, being a night owl, would join him a couple nights a week. This went on for about a year, and once a month his supervisor would show up to make sure he was doing his job. He had turned out to be a nice guy, and after about six months he asked me if I had ever thought of becoming a guard. I told him I'd never thought much about it and joked about me carrying a gun. He smiled and handed me a card and said that if I wanted to learn how to use a weapon properly to call a number on the card. An armed guard earned 30% more than one not. Any job sounded good to me at that time. My friend thought it was a great idea that his boss had taken an interest in me, and I, being a night owl, was a perfect fit for a security guard job. At the time, I was only doing odd jobs, and not many of them, so a full-time job was a great opportunity. But I was not sure that there was that many security jobs in my small town. It took me a couple weeks to call a number, but I was glad that I did. I was able to pay the cost of the lessons by doing odd jobs at the instructor's ranch, and in no time was able to save up to buy my own clock. I learned fast and gotten proficient with many of the pistols and a couple of the rifles the instructor had owned. Not long after I got my concealed carry license, my friend's boss told me of a job opening in a small town in a national park. It would mean that I'd have to move there, but it was full-time work, and from what he told me it was an easy first job to get my foot in the door with the security company. Not wanting to give up the opportunity, I put in an application. After a week, I received a confirmation letter telling me they had arranged temporary housing not far from the warehouse. I was proud of myself for being chosen, of what I was sure would have been hundreds of applications, but later I learned they had not been any others. I was still a young man, having just turned 21 and thought they just wanted to start me off on an easy job. I later understood that they were grooming me for the position. When I arrived at the bed and breakfast, I was really surprised to find that it was not just a bed in a room. There were five small efficiency apartment buildings behind their farmhouse. There was only one other guest, the old man that was to train me, and I was to replace at the warehouse. I'll only give you his first name, it was Joseph but he insists I call him Joe. He was a nice old guy, but like some old people, his mind would wander as he talked. It was definitely time for him to retire. I never found out just how old he was, but he had told me he had been a security guard at the warehouse for over 50 years. I wondered if I was really looking at my own future. I could not fathom wanting to work at the same place for that long. But Joe seemed happy with the way his life had been. He was retiring and moving in with his daughter in Florida and told me he was looking forward to going to the beach and going fishing anytime he wanted. I thought after 50 years it was well deserved. I never learned how long he had lived at the bed and breakfast, but I had a feeling that it had been a few years. The family that run the place were nice people with southern charm. They reminded me of watching Mayberry on TV. There were chickens, a couple of pigs, and a cow. There were even a few fruit trees around the house. It did seem strange to me that Joe and I were the only guests. 
but that would be a good thing with my need to sleep during the day. So when the first night of work came, I was ready. Joe had told me all about the company and what was stored at the warehouse. Its name was Paperworks Unlimited, or PWU, and was an entity of the U.S. government, unknown to the public. I had never heard of them before, but that didn't mean anything. He told me that they stored research paperwork on science projects they thought were too important to have a digital trail. The warehouse was large, two floors, one ground level and one basement. The basement level was a little bigger than a football field. There was 15 foot high shelves packed with boxes of files and films. I wondered why the security of the whole place was just one guard at night. There was no cameras or motion detectors in or around the building. My duty was to walk through the building once every two hours. The rest of the time was spent in a small office with a TV and a radio. No one cared what I did as long as I made the rounds when I was scheduled. To make sure I did, there was a clock box on both floors that needed unlocked on time with a big key. I hooked it to a belt loop on my pants. It was the only thing I had to pass to the day shift guard. There was a weekly logbook to report any unusual activity that was sent to the office once a week. I asked Joe what would happen if I didn't use the key, and he said he had no idea if he had never missed doing it. My first night had been uneventful and mostly boring to say the least. There was Wi-Fi and Joe had given me the password for my phone, so the next night I thought to bring my laptop. Joe thought I was crazy, and one only needed the TV and newspaper. He said the only reason he had a cell phone was the company insisted he have it. I, I told him that the internet was much like television, but was interactive. He just laughed and shook his head. Then as an afterthought told me that under no circumstances was I to tell anyone where that warehouse was, and that he was sure someone was watching any outgoing communications. At that time, I was not sure if what he said was true or not, so thought it best not to. The second night on the midnight walk was the first strange thing that happened. As I passed a row of shelves, I turned my flashlight and thought I seen a person. After further inspection, discovered it was a stack of boxes somebody had taken off the shelf and not put back. Joe told me that the day shift would do this once in a while just to mess with him and to see if he was paying attention as we put the boxes back. It still made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, wondering why I had not just seen them on the 6 or the 8 o'clock walk. Maybe they were there and I had missed them, but I don't think so. That week I had drove my old Chevy truck and had Joe ride with me. He was happy to just ride for a change. During that week he filled me in on what he knew of the area, the best places to eat in a small town when I didn't feel like cooking where the lakes with the biggest fish were, and what part of the woods I should stay out of. I thought this strange that in a national park there were areas that you should not go. I asked him why, and he told me that there were things in the dark one should never meet. Later that night, I went internet surfing and was surprised to discover that the area had a high number of unexplained disappearances. I wondered if it had anything to do with the warehouse. It just didn't seem right that a warehouse full of top secret research papers was not guarded better, especially in an area with a lot of disappearances. But what did I know? It was an easy job, and I had my Glock if anything happened. I got to meet the daytime guard and the man who received the boxes and put them where they should go. They both had no interest in speaking with me. I thought it was because they were both locals and I was not. There were two others that worked the weekend. One was a park ranger named Jeff. The other was some kind of survivalist who never spoke, just grunted and answered to anything I said to him. Jeff told me later not to take it personal that he didn't trust anyone. All of them had worked there for years and were all in their 60s, which I thought was a little unusual. 
It seemed to me that I was the first of the replacements that were going to happen, and they all knew it was a matter of time before they were put on retirement. At the end of the training week, I had no problem doing the little that was required, and Joe said I'd do fine. When it was time for Joe to head to his daughter's home, I was sad to see him go. As he said goodbye, he handed me an envelope and told me to read it later. I took it back to my room and set it on the coffee table and took a shower and went to bed. When I got up, I checked my bank account and seeing my first paycheck had been deposited into my account. I decided to celebrate by going out to eat dinner, not giving Joe's envelope much thought. Joe told me of a small place just outside of town named Sally's that had a great steak and served beer and wine with meals. It was a nice place. I found a table that was for two and sat down. A moment later, I was met by one of the most stunning women I have ever seen. All I could do was sit there and stare at her. She stood there a minute and then asked if I was okay. I nodded my head and asked her to bring me whatever was on tap, please. I was never one to believe in a thing like love at first sight, but that was just what happened to me that day. I learned later that night her name was Lynn, and she was the owner of Sally's daughter. She had already knew I was telling me it really was a small town. Meeting her was one of the most pleasant things that working at the warehouse brought to my life. When I reached my truck, I pulled out my e-cigarette only to find that the cartridge was empty. I stopped at the tra trading post. Much to my surprise, they didn't carry any so I had to buy a couple packs of smokes till I was able to order some cartridges online. This meant that at work and at the bed and breakfast I'd have to go outside to smoke. This was no big deal, it being early summer and the lows were only in the 50s, so not so cold out. When I got back to my room, the first thing I did was get online and order some more cartridges. Once done, I seen Joe's letter on the coffee table. I picked it up and opened it. There was only one page inside, and I was surprised by what was wrote on it. Number one, don't look into the, any of the red eyes. Number two, show no fear and never run. Number three, remember they lie most of the time. Four, never follow them into the woods. Five, what looks dead may not be dead. I find this really creepy to say the least. Why would Joe give me this? Was he trying to tell me there was more of the warehouse than just boxes of files? Maybe that it was haunted by ghosts or demons? After a few minutes I got back on the internet and looked up each line and really found a little information. There was some about red-eyed crypto creatures that had been reported, dogmen to Bigfoot. And of course, there was things about the undead. I just could not understand why Joe had given me the list. The rest of the night, my thoughts kept going from meeting Lynn to just what Joe was trying to tell me. My first night alone at the warehouse was uneventful. When I did my rounds, I would have one earbud in the tunes going because I found the silence a little eerie. On the second night, I once again found file boxes left on the floor and wondered if it was the day shift messing around like Joe said. Still without e-cigarette cartridges, I went out and stood by my car to smoke a real one. The sky was clear and the stars were bright. There was a little fog in the woods moving around that I thought gave the woods a foreboding appearance. When I was done and about to head back inside, I thought I seen something move just inside the train line, then decided it was just a trick of the light on the moving fog. There was only one other thing that happened that first week that was strange to me, and that was when I asked Jeff what he thought about the letter that Joe had given me. He, with a serious look on his face, that it was said that it was good advice and that I was a smart young man and should do some research on skinwalkers. I didn't tell him that I already had. The other thing I asked him about was the boxes of files on the floor. 
He smiled and said, just put them back, it'll be okay. I took from that that it was not the day shift that was doing it. I had heard of polar gusts before, but had never known anyone that had experienced one. I had thought about the movement I had seen in the fog and, and wondered if it could have been a skinwalker or maybe something more evil like a windigo. That was what my first months working at the warehouse was like, finding boxes of files on the floor, and every time I went out in the dark, I'd see movement in the woods or glowing eyes watching me from the shadows. It was a little unnerving, but after two weeks, it didn't bother me much at all. Near the end of that summer, I arrived at for my shift to find a parking lot full of park ranger trucks. There were four or five of them talking with Jeff. He had a worried look on his face. When I walked up, he introduced me to Bill, the head ranger, who asked that we go inside to talk. Once inside, Jeff told me that Bill knew all about the strange things that happened at and around the warehouse. He wanted to know if there had been any uptick in activity the last few nights. I told him no, it had been business as usual. When I asked Bill what was going on, he looked over at Jeff, who nodded his head, then in a low voice, almost as, as if he was embarrassed, told me they had lost 20 marine survival specialists. They had made their camp not more than a mile to the east of the warehouse three days ago and no one has seen or heard from them in the last 48 hours. I thought that they most likely were lost in the woods. After all, what could happen to marine survivalists? They were highly trained badasses. But on the other hand, how could they get lost? Bill left two of his men out in the parking lot that night. He thought they may see the warehouse lights and come there if they were lost. Later, Jeff told me that there had been an extensive search, but even after a week, there was still no clue as to what happened to the men. The rangers were told not to talk about it by the government. I told them I was sure not going to tell anyone what I knew about it. Who would believe me that I worked in a haunted warehouse in the middle of a paranormal national park anyways? Two weeks later, we got the year's first snow and I'll tell you I was not happy about how cold it became that night in the warehouse. The office was warm but the rest was unheated. I was almost late that night getting to work and had forgot to bring in my lunch so I had to go out to get it from my car. As I opened the warehouse door I could see something was on the roof of my car. What happened next will always be burned into my memory. As I stepped from the doorway there was a chilling howl that I swear made my heart skip a beat. I looked out at the dark woods and seen pairs of red, green, and yellow eyes staring at me from the dark. There could have been hundreds as far as I knew. I was not sure what to do. I just stood there at the open door staring for a good five minutes. Then the howl came again. This time others joined in. When this happened, one by one the glowing eyes blinked out and didn't return. I stood there a minute or two before I was able to walk over to my car and see what was on the roof. What I found was a little unnerving. Laying there was a combat helmet with the insignia of a major on it. I had no doubt it was from the group that had disappeared a few weeks before. Just what it meant I was not sure. Were they, or whatever they were, letting me know it was because of them? Could the helmet be some kind of warning, or could it be some kind of peace offering? I just had no clue what to think at this point. I was not sure what I should do. Did I call Ranger Bill, or should I call the Marines? After a few minutes of thinking it over, I decided it best not to call anyone. I took the helmet back into, uh, to the office to have a better look at it. I must tell you, I was shaking as I sat down to look it over. I made up my mind not to tell anyone and decided to just hide the helmet in a warehouse somewhere, hoping it was not a declaration of war. Chapter 2 
the warmth of winter. As I said before, winter had come, and the warehouse was a cold place to walk every two hours. It wasn't as cold as outside, but the quiet and stillness made it feel as though it was. To tell the truth, after that night when the helmet was left on the top of my car, I almost quit. For the next week, I would wake from dreams of red-eyed dark shapes chasing me through the woods. It made me a little nervous to be at the warehouse alone each night. Winter had always been a rough time for me, and working 12-hour shifts made it so I never got to see the sun. It was just dark before my shift and still dark when I finished each morning. To say the least, I was depressed, and the more I looked on the internet at the stories that people posted about strange things that happened in the woods, the more of them I believed. There was one thing for me that winter I will always be grateful for. On Saturday nights, I would go out to eat at Sally's restaurant, where I would get to talk with Lynn. To most people, this may not have been much, but at time, anything that made me feel normal was a good thing, or so I thought. Just as I was about to head out to dinner at Susie's, my phone rang. It was my friend's supervisor, who was the man who had gotten me the job at the warehouse. He called to let me know that my supervisor would be stopping by on Monday night and was bringing a new security guard with him. I wondered just what the supervisor knew about what went on at the warehouse. He didn't tell me who the new guard was or why they were coming, but right then I only wanted to go to dinner where I'd get to see Lynn, even if it was just when she took my order. In that first six months at the warehouse, she was my only anchor to reality. I got a real surprise when I arrived at Sally's that night. I expected to see Lynn in her cute wa waitress uniform, but to my surprise she was standing there in street clothes, smiling. Bewildered, I just stared at her. She giggled at the look on my face and told me she had taken the night off and wondered if I would have dinner with her. I told her of course I would, and suggest we take a seat. She shook her head and told me not there but at her ranch, and she was cooking. She made me forget all about work at the warehouse that night. Her ranch had been in her family for 150 years, and she had lived there her whole life. Her mother had moved to town a couple of years ago after Lynn's father had gone missing on a hunting trip. She had a few cows, horses, a couple of acres of growing land. She had one ranch hand to run the place who had worked there for years. The meal that she cooked was exquisite. I had to ask her just what it was. Telling me it was an old family recipe for ham, I, I was surprised that it didn't taste like any ham I had had before. I asked her just what type of seasoning she used, but she just giggled and said that if she told me she would have to kill me. She had sworn an oath to her grandmother she would only teach it to any daughters that she might have. At the time, I didn't pay much attention to the fact that her father had disappeared, and the other thing at the time was her ranch was not more than three miles from the warehouse. I was too taken with Lynn to really think about the way my life had become, and she was making me feel normal. I do believe that if I had not met Lynn, I would have quit my job. I must tell you, that weekend was one of the best that I had had in my life. She had to be back to work at 8 on Sunday night, and I didn't have to be back to work at the warehouse till Monday at 6, so I had time to rest up before work, which was a good thing as I was to meet my supervisor for the first time after being on the job for three months, and he was bringing a new guard with him. They were to arrive at 7. I would have time to check on where I had hid the helmet and make sure it was still safe. There was no way I was going to let him know about it. I wondered if he knew any of the things that went on at the warehouse. The eyes that watched from the edge of the woods or the files that would be left on the floor. There was also places I felt I was not welcome to be at times. I would try to avoid them as much as I could. Right at seven on the dot, a big black Ford pulled up. I was standing at the door watching through the window. As the driver got out, it started to snow lightly. He opened the 
back door. A man in his 60s, dressed more like a senator than a security guard supervisor, stepped out of the car, followed by a young woman. She didn't have the look of a guard. I thought maybe she was his secretary. Now, I'm only going to give you first names, not going to give you their real names. The old man introduced himself as Samuel, and he worked for the Department of Defense, and he was my supervisor. The DOD, I thought. I was working for a security company at a government warehouse, not working for the DOD. I was not sure if I liked this at all. I would never have taken the job if I knew that I'd be a government employee. I had no love for the government, believing they never had the people's interest on the top of their to-do list. He seen by the look on my face that I was not a happy camper and explained my job was not an accident or just a luck of being picked. I had been chosen for the job. I asked him what he, what he was talking about and he told me that it had to do with a lot of factors where and when I was born, to my blood type, and the color of my eyes, which were light blue. Saying he would speak with me at a later date about all this, but now his time was limited. He knew all about what went on at the warehouse and had for years. He turned to the young woman and told me she was Dr. Ricky, and she had several doctrines. I found this surprising her being as pretty, so pretty and no more than 25 or so. She told me she was there to study the paranormal happenings at the warehouse and her crew was setting up all her equipment the next day and she would be joining me for the night shift. I looked at Samuel who was nodding his head and added that she was staying at the bed and breakfast and would need a ride. I told them I didn't mind. They said goodbye and out the door they went. That was just the start of a strange night for me. On every walk that night there were stacks of boxes off the shelf and for the first time there was even a little fog down one lane of the files. Needless to say, I, I didn't go down there. A couple of times I heard sounds that I had no idea what they were. I had the feeling that the warehouse didn't like the idea that Dr. Ricky was there. At 6 a.m. when I left I noticed there were eyes watching from the woods. That was when I realized that Lynn's ranch was just a few miles behind that section of the woods. I would have to ask her if she had ever seen them around her ranch and what she knew about her father's disappearance. Being raised in the area, she may know a lot about the things that happened in the park. Dr. Ricky turned out to be a nice person and very passionate about her work. I did wonder how a young lady look, that looked as good as she did had been able to get several doctrines without young men getting in the way. I never bothered to ask her at the time what her doctrines were in, assuming she would not be able to tell me under national security issues. She told me to drop the doctor and just call her Ricky, as if it was only going to be the two of us. As we were heading into work that first night, we passed three large trucks on the way out. And Ricky said this was good. It meant that all our equipment had been installed and was at the ready. The day guard was standing outside smoking when we pulled up. He handed me the lock key and said good luck, got in his truck and was gone in no time. He had not even given me enough time to introduce Ricky to him. I looked at her and she was smiling as she had expected this type of treatment or had experienced it before. I had checked the weather before I had left home. It was not going to snow, but it was going to get windy and the temperatures was going down to the mid-twenties before dawn. I opened the door and let Ricky enter before me, and it was best that I did. When I stepped in, I stopped dead in my tracks. It no longer looked like the office that I had been coming to for almost half a year. The old desk was gone, and in its place was a brand new oak one, two times the size. The old couch had been replaced by two new recliners, and that was the least of my surprise. The wall with the door into the warehouse had 10 or 12 filing cabinets, and the other had 10 computers. Each had its own monitor on a countertop that ran the whole length. There were two seats on wheels for working at the computer that looked to be comfortable if one had to spend hours in them. I didn't have time to marvel at the changes long. I had to make my first walkthrough. I told Ricky that I would be back in a few minutes. 
but I don't think she heard me as she was already turning on the computers, not even taking her coat off. On my way back from the basement, I seen a book laying just in front of a rack of files. I reached down, picked it up, and was about to put it back on the shelf when I heard Ricky's voice tell me not to put it back but to bring it to her. I looked around but was unable to see any cameras. She had to have seen me on one of the computer monitors. I was not sure that I liked the idea of being watched like that. I did as she asked and when she looked at it she smiled and asked me if I looked at the title. I shook my head no and she handed it back to me. I looked and was kind of shocked. The title read, The Reality of Unexplained Paranormal Experiences by Dr. Ricky. She was amused by the look on my face. She explained that the government had classified the book and by me finding it just then meant that the warehouse knew that she was there. I asked what she thought was going on in the warehouse and she said it wasn't just the warehouse, it was the whole park. But the warehouse was at its center. Once the marine survivors went missing, she was called in. The first thing she did was learn all she could about the area, going as far as having new satellite pictures made, including infrared and something new called LIDAR. I asked her if she should be telling me all this. Her answer was that the day I took the job I was given a top security clearance even if I didn't know it. It would seem that my life had become a B-movie. She told me this new LIDAR showed what was underground, and they found that the warehouse was sitting on top of a huge cavern, almost a mile deep, with many tunnels. It dawned on me that this was the warmth of winter that the creatures in the woods would need to survive the cold. I asked her just what she thought the cavern had to do with the paranormal happenings in the park. She said that was why she was there, to find out what the cause was and how to stop it. At the time, I thought this a little funny to think that a young woman of 25 or 26, even with a few doctrines and a rookie security guard, could really do anything to stop what was happening there. It took a week before Ricky was able to video anything that may be called paranoia, and that was a group of file boxes just dropped off a shelf, but to me it looked like they had just fallen, not being put there securely in the first place. We did see the eyes watching from the woods that we left in the morning a couple of times. Over the next few days, I talked with Lynn a couple of times on the phone and told her about Ricky. She acted as if she didn't mind, but I could tell she was not comfortable with the idea I was spending so much time with her. I was not able to tell her the real reason why she was there, so I told her my boss wanted to change it to a two-person watch. I didn't like the idea that I couldn't tell her the truth about the warehouse. That Saturday night, I didn't go to dinner at Sally's like I had been, but instead showed up at what would have been the end of Lynn's shift, only to find out she had taken the night off. I had talked with her the night before and she had not said anything about it, and I thought this was a little strange and hoped that she was not getting sick. I decided to go by the ranch and see if she was okay even though it was just past midnight, knowing that she would normally be up. Being been March, the weather was getting warmer and most of the snow was gone. The air was still cool, but it was a nice clear night. I topped the hill about a half a mile before the ranch and was surprised by two ranger trucks parked just off the road. I thought it best to pull over and see if they may need some help, but when I got out, there was no one around. One of the trucks was a head Ranger Bills, the others was Jeff's, who also worked at the warehouse as a guard on the weekend and really should have been at work right then. I yelled out to them to let them know I was there. A moment later, Jeff walked from the trees, and when he seen that it was me, he told me to be quiet and follow him. After a two-minute walk, we met Ranger Bill standing overlooking Lynn's ranch. They didn't need to say anything, nor would I have heard it if they did. I was shocked by what I see. The ranch was lit up like a county fair, and they had to have been a good 250 people standing in a semicircle in front of what looked to be an altar. On the altar was a calf. Standing next to it was Lynn, holding up a knife. 
It made my head spin and my knees become weak as I realized what was going on and who was doing it. Lynn moved her arms around as she spoke to the group. I was unable to hear what was being said, but could hear the group cheering her on. I looked over at the rangers and noticed that Bill was recording it. I looked back and noticed that behind Lynn, just inside of the wood line, were the glowing eyes that I had been seeing all along at the warehouse. The group began to chant. As the noise grew, Lynn suddenly reached around the calf's neck and in one swift move slit its throat. Steam rose in the cool air as the blood poured over the altar and onto the ground. I had just witnessed a sacrifice that was held by my girlfriend, so to say the least, I was in shock. Jeff grabbed my shoulder and told me that we needed to move. I followed him back to the trucks where Jeff told me to go home and not to tell anyone what I had just seen. It was only a 15 minute ride, but it felt as though it took an hour. I found it hard to keep my mind on the road. I also found it hard to believe that the sweet woman who I had so much feeling for has turned out to be some kind of evil princess. I got home and sat down. I didn't even turn on the TV or get online. I noticed that Ricky was still up, but I was not sure if I should tell her about what I had seen. If there was anyone who may understand it, it would have been her. But could I trust her any more than the woman I thought of as my girlfriend? I must tell you that night was when I realized that I would never have what others would call a normal life. I wondered just why it was me that was chosen for the job at the warehouse. Samuel had told me he was explained at some point, but for now I could only wonder. I'm not the kind of person that would let things slide by me without finding out why things were the way they were. I needed answers, even if I didn't like them. I could just pack a bag, jump in, jump in my truck and get the hell out of there, or should I stick around and try to deal with all the strange things that were happening? It really was a simple choice to make, but my mind was spinning and my emotions were on high alert and was going to take some time for me to make a decision. So I guess that I'm just going to have to get back with you on that. Chapter 3 A New Job I really thought I'd have time to wrap my mind around the fact that the woman that I had so much feeling for would be able to do what I had seen Lynn do. I was not at home more than 15 minutes when there was a knock on the door. When I opened it, I was not surprised that it was Ranger Bill standing there. I invited him in and told him to have a seat. As he took a seat and unbuttoned his coat, pulled out a videotape, handed it to me, saying that he had just talked with Supervisor Samuel and he was told to give me the tape for him to pick up on Monday night. I was not sure if I wanted to take it. By taking it, I was locked into staying, or at least until Monday anyways. I asked him what did he have to do with the DOD and he told me that the whole park and the rangers were under Samuel's control and had been for years along with many who lived in the town. I didn't find this all that surprising. I then asked just how long did he know that Lynn was more than just a waitress. His answer was since her father had disappeared she had been under investigation. If it had been up to him I would have been told about her but Samuel thought that I could be a way into the inner circle if she thought I was just a security guard, and any other questions Samuel would answer on Monday for me. I didn't like the idea that the DOT thought they had the right to use me in this or in any way without my knowing about it. He stood up, then added that he wouldn't expect me to tell him how to run the rangers, but he thought that running the warehouse I should tell Ricky about what I had learned as soon as I could. I'm not sure why he thought that I ran the warehouse, but I did think he was right about telling Ricky. He said goodnight and left. I sat the tape down and went and got, got a beer from the fridge, and before I sat back down there was a knock on the door. I was not surprised that it was Ricky. She seen the beer in my hand and asked if I had another. I said of course and handed it to her, got me another as she sat down. She told me that she knew that I had plans to meet Lynn and that she had seen that I was home and Ranger Bullet showed up. She thought she should check to see if everything was alright. 
I told her I was fine, but everything was not okay. Telling her she needed to see the tape as I put it in and turned the TV on. She had me play it twice before she said anything. She shook her head saying she was sorry that Lynn was not who I thought she was. What was happening was what was called blood magic. She was unable to tell from the video what was being chanted, but if we were able to upload it to the computers at the warehouse, she may be able to clean it up some. It was an important spell that was being cast, but by the sacrifice, it not being human, was not top level. I asked her what she thought of all the glowing eyes in the woods behind Lynn. She said that there was a couple of questions about them. Are they there as part of the sacrifice or to spy on the group? They were good questions, I thought. Could the skinwalkers or the Wendigo or whatever they may be be part of Lynn's covenant? I couldn't believe the way my life had become so strange. All I wanted was a nice, easy, full-time job. Instead, I joined some kind of circus. I looked and it was 3 a.m., which was mid-afternoon for us. I asked her if she thought we should call Samuel, and she said that I told her that Bill already did. I had. I had just forgot. My mind was swirling. I was about to tell her that that when suddenly there was a loud thud on the back wall of the bungalow that made both of us jump to our feet. I grabbed my Glock and a flashlight, told Ricky to stay there, and she said no way she was staying alone and that I should put my coat on. It was cold, but most of the snow was gone and everything was wet. I went to the door and I opened it as quickly as I could. Ricky followed me out. I grabbed my clock, resting on my arm that held the flashlight out in front of me. I can tell you I was nervous as I rounded the corner, but there was nothing there. I turned to go back when Ricky pointed at the ground. I looked to where she had pointed and seen a barefoot print in the mud. It was a good 15 inches long and was deep. I looked at the tree line about a hundred yards away and as I passed my light around two yellow eyes shined. Something was watching us, but I didn't get the same feeling from it as I did from the eyes at the warehouse. We went back inside and Ricky asked me what I thought it was. I was not sure what to tell her. The only thing I could think of was it was a Sasquatch, but whatever it was wanted us to know it was there. I asked her if she had ever heard of Sasquatch in the area in her studies of the park. She shook her head no, saying there had never been a report of them. I told her we needed to call Jeff to come take a look at the footprint and make a cast of it. She agreed, but said we needed to take the tape to the warehouse so she could upload it and clean it up. I would not need to bring my video player, she had one there. Once she set it up, it would run on its own and should be ready by Monday night when Samuel was to be there. When we got to the warehouse, Jeff was there on the job again. I didn't ask him how he was with Bill watching Lynn's ranch if he should have been at work. I told him about what happened in the footprint. He said he'd come over when his shift was over with and do a casting of it. He only had 45 minutes to go, so we'd be there in an hour, just as it was getting light out. I decided to go uptown, get us biscuits before heading home. Before we reached home, I received a call from Lynn. This was not a call that I really wanted to get, but I was going to have to talk with her sooner or later. When I answered, she said she was sorry that she was not at work last night, but she was not feeling well and stayed home. I told her not to worry about it, that I had worked late and had only stopped by to say hi. I told her that we started doing an inventory of the warehouse who would be working long hours for the next week or so. She told me that she was having a few friends over for a barbecue next Sunday and wanted me to come. I told her that sounded good and she said to invite Ricky along. When we reached the bed and breakfast, Jeff was coming from behind my place carrying a pail. He said that he found two more tracks and all three would take a couple hours to dry. I held up the bag of biscuits and said, I hope you like biscuits, and he said I most likely didn't get enough. As we ate and drank coffee, I asked Jeff to tell me what he knew about what went on in the park. He told me that his family had moved there when he was 14, but was 
Not until he had turned 15 did he see anything that could be called strange. Bill and him had been boyhood friends then and had went on a week-long camping trip. Bill knew of a lake that few would go to because of how hard it was to get to. It, it was a small valley you couldn't see until you reached the top of a small mountain ridge. Bill's father had built a large platform in an oak tree to set up camp off the ground. It was bare in, the, in that area of the park. They had to fix a few boards, but it was a safe place. It was a good 20 feet off the ground overlooking the lake that was about half a mile wide and three miles long. He set a tarp over one corner to keep the dew off them as they slept. The next morning they went hunting and it was not long before Bill had shot an eight point buck. Not wanting to bring any more blood back to the camp than they had to, they gutted it there. They carried it to the lake and washed it off before taking it back. Hanging it up, skinned it, and salted it. Then they hoisted it up a good 15 feet off the ground, being sure that no bear could reach it. They may have been young, but they did know how to act in the woods. It was late that second night when Bill shook him awake, saying to be quiet. They could hear something moving around on the ground. They slowly moved over to look down on what it was. All they could see was a big dark shape moving. He could tell it was walking on two legs, but didn't walk like a man's movement. It moved over to where the rope that held the deer up, up was, and they heard the deer hit the ground with a thud. It looked up at them, and they could see its eyes glowing red in the dark. He howled like an angry dog grabbed the deer and ran off into the woods with a rope following like a snake. I could see that just telling the tale was upsetting Jeff even after 50 years. He said that was just the first time that he had seen the dog man. And a couple of times there was evidence of them being around when somebody had disappeared. He then spent the next two hours telling Ricky and me what he knew about the park that there was way more happening than I thought. When the casts were dry, I let Jeff keep one of them to show Bill and would take the others to show Samuel. Ricky and I spent the day together and I must say I really enjoyed spending some time with her that was not work related. I learned that she was from a small town out west. When she turned 15, she went to a university on the east coast and went to work for Samuel when she was 19. As we rode in Monday night, we passed two trucks coming out of the warehouse. When I got out of my truck, I seen that there were cameras on the outside now. Ricky was smiling. I knew that she had liked the idea of being able to see the outside. I did my first round as Ricky sat to look over the weekend videotapes. It really looked like more work than one person could handle, I thought. And with all the cameras, there really was r little need to do, do the walk through every two hours. Samuel was bringing the warehouse to a state of, of the art readiness, and I didn't blame him with all that was happening in the park. Nothing was out of place on my walk. I was happy. I wanted to get back and see what the computer was able to do with the video of Lynn. Ricky had the video ready by the time I got back to the office. I knew that she had not had time to go over the weekend recording so fast, but like me, she was interested in just what Lynn had said. She closed in on Lynn's face and said she was talking in Latin. You could hear some of it, but I didn't know Latin anyways. Ricky did and was able to make it out. She watched it three times before she said anything, and what she told me I really didn't like. It was the second of three sacrifices that needed to be done to bring a demon to lead an army. The third would require a human sacrifice that would have to be carried out within the next three months, she said. I asked her if she believed it could be done, and she said it didn't matter if we believed, only that the day did. The more I got to know Ricky, the more she surprised me. She was passionate about everything she did. I could understand how she was able to get a few doctrines as young as she had. It was near 9 p.m. when Samuel's car pulled up and two men got out. 
opened the trunk and each got out a box as Samuel got out. I opened the door for him. The men put the boxes next to the desk and went back out without saying anything. Samuel took off his coat, laid it on the boxes, and stood there smiling. Ricky was the first to say anything, asking him if he enjoyed his country ride. He said that she knew better than that. He hated to be out of the city for any time. He was all business the last time he was there, and it was going to be no different this time, I thought. He asked to see the video, so Ricky told him what they had done with it and then played it for him. He watched it two times and then asked if Ricky thought they could stop the third sacrifice. She answered with a yes, but only if we could find out when it was to happen. It was almost ten and I told them I needed to do my walk. Samuel laughed and said, do you really think that the key turned anything on or off? It was just a way to get someone to do a walk every few hours, but now with all the cameras there was no need. He looked at me and said he had news for me that I might not like. I thought he was going to let me go, now that Ricky and her cameras were all set up, but that wasn't what happened. He smiled at the worried look on my face. I believe he was enjoying this. He said not to worry about my job, there was going to be a lot more work for me in the coming days. He was handing over control of not only the warehouse, but of the whole park over to me. That would include the rangers. I couldn't believe what he was saying. I had no clue how to run a car wash, let alone a national park. He pointed at the boxes and said that in one was a list of 600 personnel that would be able to show up within a week to start work. I would just have to pick out who I thought would be a good guard. If I wanted, I could change the roster to three eight-hour shifts of three people. Each one who worked at the warehouse now were to be retired unless there was someone I wanted to keep. As far as the park rangers were concerned, Bill and Jeff were to stay, and the rest were up to me and Bill. I'll not tell you how much money he said I had available, but it was more than some third world country's debt. I couldn't believe what I was hearing from him. Just how could he believe that I could be the person for any job like that? The whole time Ricky sat there smiling at me. I had the feeling that she knew about this from the first day she came there and may even have been part of making the decision for me to take control. I asked Sam Samuel why me and he was about to answer me when there was a knock on the door. One of the men opened it and said that if they were going to make the flight they had to go. He apologized but he had to be in DC at 6 a.m saying next time he was there he would explain why I was chosen, but for now it may be best that I didn't know. Grabbing his, his coat, he told me that boxes were reports of everything that had happened in the park over the last 50 years, and that Ricky would help me deal with all that was ahead of me, and out the door he went. I'm not sure if I was in some kind of shock or just really confused, but I was not liking any of it. From the moment that I took the job at the warehouse, my life had become like an X-File episode. I had learned that Polar Gus, Dogman, Windigo, and Bigfoot were all real. I had grown fond of a woman that turned out to be some kind of Satanist princess who wanted me to come to a barbecue next Sunday. Samuel and a few others at the DOT thought that Ricky and I were the ones to get to the bottom of everything that was going on at the park. To tell you the truth, I didn't think I was the right choice to do this, nor was I sure that I was going to try. I just had too much thinking before I could seriously consider taking on that kind of responsibility.